Well, it's certainly a pleasure to be here today and to have a chance to share a little bit of uh, some of our experience at Think Big around uh, big data and, and what, it, what it can do and what it can mean. Um, it's an exciting time um, in, in the enterprise. I think as, as those of you who are boxers know, um, the, the tides of change is really coming to IT and it's a, a chance to innovate and create uh, great value. So ultimately, uh, w when we started Think Big, it was because we saw there was this, this trend where uh, some amazing new technology had, had matured and, and become available at pioneers like my old company, Quantcast, and like these companies that you know of like Facebook and Yahoo where uh, people were wrestling with problems that required uh, petabytes of data and uh, new techniques, techniques which often actually been pioneered back at Google. So what we saw the opportunity to do is to start applying these technologies to create real value um, in a range of companies and industries that was broader than the first companies and use cases. And indeed, as we look, uh, we see that now um, in 2013 that you've got big data is having an impact across a whole range of industries you know whether it's a software company a hardware company an online service whether you're looking at marketing and advertising supply chain and manufacturing life sciences and healthcare government telecommunications you've got a you've got a, a continuing trend of, of what people are doing and how they're using big data to really change the dynamic of their industries. So engaging customers with recommendation engines, uh, detecting risk of people uh, switching cell phone plans, uh, responding to incoming events from devices. Uh, we'll talk about some examples uh, during this talk of this, but uh, across the board, um, the, the, the thing that we see happening is that you've got new sets of data with more complexity and needs to uh, analyze the data and work with it in an unprecedented way that had, has not been possible before is quickly becoming mandatory. So this change is, is really driven, uh, you know, if you look back, you had this trigger uh, a few years ago of web scale companies needing to work with massive amounts of data for act things like web activity, advertising, geolocation, and um, the pioneers that often had a single application like web search for this technology found that it was incredibly good at providing an infrastructure for building a whole range of products and capabilities. And um, that's led to this trigger in the market of uh, uh, just a ton of innovation. The first wave of innovation came about really from open source, where you had uh, community development, where a number of the early users of big data invested in technologies like Hadoop and Cassandra and HBase um, that were being built by the users for the users to solve their problems. And then the, the second wave of innovation kicked in where you had venture investment starting to fund innovative product companies with an open source business model like a Cloudera or Datastax. And then most recently you've seen the third wave where the large systems companies in the, of the world, the EMCs and IBMs and, and so forth, have really kicked in and said that they're making this a core part of their product plans. So needless to say, what you've got is you've got this explosion of innovation, which is very exciting, but also more than a little confusing uh, for people that are trying to figure out how to, uh, how to move from the, the promise of big data to real value in their organizations. You know, so I think it's worth pointing out what are some of the impediments that people are facing. Uh, and I think you've probably seen lots of pieces talking about the promise of big data and how exciting it is, but it's just as important to think about what are the things that, that sometimes hold it back from achieving that value. You know, I think one of the biggest ones is uh, science projects where you'll have an or in an organization people will test something out but they, they don't have a, a clear plan for how to really connect it in with the business and, and achieve something meaningful. Uh, you know, small efforts that don't have the resources to really connect through to an ultimate result. I mean, we've seen a lot of organizations where there, people are working in a playpen and then a year later it's still in the playpen because they don't have the resources to really connect it and do something meaningful. Um, 
definitely a skills gap. Uh, I, I would say that startups have generally had a better time uh, with this. The company that the access to the talent here in Silicon Valley is pretty unique. So you see more people with skills and aptitudes in this space than in a lot of other geographies. But um, it is a new space, and it's not just a question of being a really good developer uh, or a really good analyst with SQL. There's some new tricks to learn, working with unstructured data, new methodologies for how to work with data, and uh, distributed programming and working in a, a cluster environment is also a little bit different. And um, you know, I think, I think the other impediments are often really applying uh, older techniques. So uh, especially in, in uh, IT departments that are, have been used to uh, business as usual and kind of cutting costs and not innovating, it's, it's changing a mindset for how do you start to drive value from technology again. And I think you know, Jeffrey Moore has put this well as you're talking about hey, the, tide, the tide has turned, that it's time for a new era of value creation from IT. And I think big data is a core part of that story about how you can really uh, connect the business with value. So let's, let's take a little bit more of a look. Um, one, one example of a kind of application that we're, uh, that we're seeing um, with big data is uh, around device and software data. So you, know, you, you hear so much about consumer data, web, and online advertising, mobile. I'll talk about that later. But I think it's interesting to note that uh, when you look at data that's being generated automatically by machines and by software programs, you know, antivirus programs, uh, servers and IT departments, software as a service capturing logs and information. Now, these uh, and the, the Internet of Things, uh, you know, uh, cars moving around, mobile phones. That th these devices the, uh, that generate data, there's some really interesting uh, capabilities of applying, again, big data techniques to working with those, those data sets. So from a technical standpoint, what you see is um, the, uh, the explosion in unstructured data is ultimately being driven by machine-generated data. Uh, the, uh, the, the structured data, or data that's being generated by people is growing exponentially because the population of the world is growing exponentially, but at a much lower rate than, than we're hooking up machines with sensors and, and readings. So the, 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 the dominant term is really the growth of unstructured data from devices. Uh, so, so often you see uh, organizations that are trying to cope with uh, a scaling problem of how do they, how do they accept the, these massive volumes of data um, and big data becomes an interesting technology to handle this problem. It also uh, provides for a pretty unique ability to do analysis and an ad hoc analysis on data. So we often see the kind of three steps of how people implement big data. The first being putting in a basic infrastructure to hold the data and to be able to do some transformations and compute some basic analysis on it. A second step of starting to, to have exploratory capabilities, ad hoc analysis, to be able to poke at the data and understand it. And this can be incredibly powerful. And in a device data space, this can mean having a more advanced support engineer being able to look at raw information about a problem that's not easy to resolve and, and quickly understand what's really going on. Um, you know, it could, could be useful for uh, product engineers to do product planning, understand what are the kind of situations where customers run into a problem with this technology and being able to look at real cases with ad hoc analysis tools. Um, this is driven by the notion that with big data, you can capture all the data and have deep history instead of uh, the classic paradigm prior to big data was how quickly can I get rid of the data? How little do I need? How much can I summarize it? Because I don't have the resources to build this stuff. In the big data space, it's about how do I create value from data? What new data sets can I integrate in to add value to what I already have? So that, that ability to capture history and blend data becomes very powerful. And you know, as you go beyond ad hoc analysis, you get finally to what we think is the highest value use of big data is starting to automate decisions. So building predictive models that increasingly drive automated response. So things like um, for devices, identifying a device that might fail and proactively fixing it or analyzing the root cause of a problem uh, to be able to better mitigate it or prioritize uh, defect resolution in software code base, uh, identifying capacity limits that are approaching, you know, controlling a system to mitigate uh, the consequences of something happening. These are examples of predictive models on device data that 
you know, the, the goal is not to have an army of analysts looking at spreadsheets saying, well, this thing is going to fail, so let's go fix it. It's to automate that and to have a better and better model that tells you these are the things that are going to fail, these are the things that we need to be addressing, and have people instead spending their time looking at how do we make it even better. Um, so those are some of the, the cases of, uh, you know, if you look at this from a technical standpoint, uh, how device and software data analytics can benefit from big data. Maybe it's worth taking a quick look at, at what this might look like as an example of, of some of the technologies and flows um, where you might have data coming in from a variety of devices that get ingested in, blended with relational data, and then stored in either Hadoop or a you NoSQL know, database such as HBase. And then ultimately that can be pushed out. So, so that environment can use the full data, allows for ad hoc analysis, and it also allows for quick summarization with search indexing and low latency database access. Um, and indeed it can be fed into automated models to respond uh, to events as they're coming in. So you get a, a you actually you have this closed loop of events coming in and they're informed by information that's being uh, summarized at the point that the, the, the event comes in. So we're applying a model that was predictive to understand what's going on. So you, you have this flow of different data sets coming together and being using different technologies. I think that's also an important point is, uh, we're not gonna talk a lot about all the different technologies that are being used in big data solutions, but it's not a one size fits all approach. Um, it's not a case of, well, you just implement Hadoop and everything is solved. I mean, Hadoop is great for batch analysis and for long-term storage and for uh, doing some interesting predictive anal analytics modeling. But you need things like solar for distributed search indexing. You need technologies like HBase and Cassandra for low latency uh, data lookup. And you still need relational databases for uh, uh, analytic you know, summary data access for uh, data analysts. So we see uh, this being an elegant integration of tools for, that are best in class for what they do uh, coming together to build a great architecture to solve problems. So, you know, what is the net effect? You put this stuff together, what is it really doing for the business? Well, as you think about this in device analytics, we see a number of interesting use cases. Uh, we see organizations that are driving increased sales, where it might be uh, that are cross-selling or upselling, understanding the customer and what, what they're trying to do, better renewals, where you, uh, you have an early warning, perhaps, of somebody using an online service that their usage is declining and they're at risk of churning. Um, you can drive better service, you know, better customer satisfaction, uh, reducing the cost of support uh, by being proactive and having models. And, and by, by automating and simplifying, you, you can focus resources on the hard problems and, and make the simple things uh, handled, more, handled more easily. And of course, long-term benefits are harder to quantify around things like better product planning, but having data and not simply intuition uh, in that area is really important. I mean, this is an extension of the, of the now well understood idea that you should A-B task product features where you can to learn from data as to what's working and not. And indeed, those ideas of A-B testing and predictive models work quite well together where you, would build, you can build a model and test out a new approach to interacting with events, users, uh, and prove that a new approach is more effective so that you can become the new uh, champion, the new approach for how you interact. Um, and then finally, we see you know, interesting cases where organizations have data exhaust. They've got value in their data. It could be you know, network data that they're monitoring. It could be uh, data that they're, they're capturing from uh, interactions on a, in a social environment. And they're saying, well, how do we generate new revenue? Is there an opportunity for us to actually have data become a part of our business model? Maybe it's blending some of the data we have with new data sets that we can sell it to third parties. Maybe it's enabling our customers with richer analytics, sandboxes to blend some of their data in with the data that we've got. But we're seeing that as another element that a lot of companies are thinking about of how do we take the valuable data that we're generating and make that more valuable to our customers. We also see that in terms of how companies are thinking about how they can use data to empower efficiencies across a supply chain and information value chain. So that's another important element too. So I hope it's an example of some of the interesting ways that applying big data can really drive meaningful business outcomes. 
right? So the, 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 again, the, the, the theme here is, and, and this is one example of an interesting area, there are many, where big data can have a big impact. And you know, we work with customers on a variety of these kinds of device networks, problems with software companies, hardware companies, network providers, energy companies. Um, so the, the, the applications are diverse of these technologies. You know, the segue over to another industry, if you look at the retail industry, um, you've got, again, uh, lots of uh, pioneering uh, application of big data. Recommendation engines is the first thing that will jump to mind when you think about how do you apply big data into a retail context, right? What is the, what is the, the best product to suggest that you might want to buy um, if you just bought something or based on your, your past? purchase history combined with your recent propensity, maybe you just did a search. There's other interesting ones too, like better identification of fraud um, and, and threats, being able to do systematic market basket analysis. So doing things like looking at uh, the combinations of items to say what, in a physical store, what items are likely to, to correlate and sell together that might be useful for promoting, uh, offering promotions on one type of item to drive purchases of another. So you know, it's again, it's about blending online and offline data. You know, we see innovative uh, uh, new data sets coming online for retailers, whether it be video, whether it be using Wi-Fi to, to observe people walking through a physical store, locate, uh, locate uh, products, you know, working with a company intelligence that has an innovative uh, service for mobile apps to let you find nearby physical uh, products that you could purchase. Um, you know, so, so there's, there's a range of innovative new data sets coming in, uh, plus an increasing sense of in physical retail, a blended environment where there's more online and more mobile activity. And of course, in the online world, there's a lot of activity already um, where there's rich data sets that are big data. So these things come together, again, in the, in the retail industry where there's significant opportunity to create new value by building customer intimacy. And ultimately, you know, we think that, um, that when you start dealing with interaction with the consumer, big data has a tremendous potential to drive insights and engagement. Um, you know, it's a, a phrase that I think is becoming important is systems of engagement, where a website, mobile activity, um, these are ways that you're really engaging with customers and trying to build your interaction and understand them. And so how, how can big data help us with systems of engagement? Um, maybe this time we'll talk, start from the business and then back into what the technical reasons are why these things happen, right? So classic example, again, in any system of engagement would be next best offer, being able to make good recommendations, good offers to people. Um, in, in a world where increasingly people are uh, accessing data on the move and with, with smaller screens, it, um, it's really important to have good ideas about what's appealing to them. Uh, if you have a, a big, uh, web uh, display on a, a, a modern monitor, you've got lots of room to put many different ideas and options. But when you're uh, down to a small cell phone or tablet, you need to be more uh, focused on what is the user actually interested in doing so you can present something relevant to them. Um, you know, mass personalization, uh, driving individual level offers uh, is really important. You know, we see this as a big shift. So many organizations we see are still thinking about how they engage with customers in terms of segments and sort of stereotypes of the kind of people and, and predefined rules where some analysts will say, well, if, if the person has done this and this and this, let's put this thing in front of them. Um, and we, we think that there's a big opportunity to shift to these big data-driven machine learned models where you have automated intelligence that says, this is the kind of thing that's really gonna to appeal to this person, not because they're in this stereotype category, but because we know these characteristics about them and it really is gonna resonate. Um, you know, when we see this in applications for advertising, we see this in applications for uh, online retail, we see this in generating offers for credit card holders, you know, across a range, and you see this in, in retail banking, you know, across a range of industries where you're engaging the individual, engaging them, um, really understanding their interests and, and taking the time to break apart their activities, it can create, drive great benefits. You know, this can also be used beyond, beyond selling to people, it can be servicing them better, understanding what's, what's relevant to them, identifying you know, customers that might be at risk of churning or, or reducing or removing their use of your service, 
finding fraud and risk, you know, using video techniques to stay one step ahead of bad guys who are, who are uh, trying to commit fraud to identify giveaway patterns and that. Of course, that's an endless cat and mouse game where better technology is critical. Um, even, even assessing customer lifetime value. So, you know, in, in, getting insights and engagement with the individual is a rich field, but I think um, really these kind of big data driven models have so much potential. And, you know, it's being driven in some sense by uh, the increasing amount of data, right? That you've got mobile and web and geographic data, social data, um, CRM, and uh, transactional data, and third party feed, right? So there's this range of data sets. And a lot of the magic, a lot of it is about being able to put these data sets into a common environment and about being able to um, much more quickly in an agile way try out ideas, test and learn. Most of the intuition, uh, a lot of times what, what people try when they're doing this kind of data science is already accounted for. There's not an extra benefit. But when you find the new models that really have a, an impact and you find things that really are, uh, make a difference, it, makes it, it ha can have a big impact on the business. And when you, you, think about, um, you think about this, another way of looking at it is uh, uh, Norvig's idea that uh, better data beats smarter algorithms, more data beats smarter algorithms, that really uh, a, lot of, a lot of what's possible now is to, to throw larger sets of data, more complete sets of data at a problem and drive better business results. And when you think about uh, you know, kind of the opportunity or the large scale revenue in a big organization or uh, kind of profit margins, making a small difference on those metrics can make a big impact on the company. You know, not, not, stepping back you know, a, a little bit more technically, uh, the, another important uh, approach, another important area that we see often IT departments championing is this notion of a big data warehouse or a data lake is an idea of having an integration point for all the data in an organization, a kind of an active archive, and it becomes a platform for innovative tools for exploration and looking at data in a raw format, you know, a place where you can have massive compute, where you have access to CPUs and storage at 10 to 100 times less price than traditional environments. And uh, it, 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 again, it supports a range of use cases, from simply transforming and loading the data into classic analytic environments, up to use cases where you start seeing the ability to explore and analyze data with resources not possible before, and to ultimately being able to do back testing and sophisticated modeling to keep driving better and better optimization in, in, uh, in business use cases. From a, from a business standpoint, this is often popular for technology groups because it, it can be a place where they start by cutting some costs, containing costs, but low, low cost in a lower cost environment with lots of capability. And um, it, the agile approach to analytics that this allows of working with data in a raw form and kind of seeing the value in the data and then investing in more structure once the data is, the value has been proven, this can generate significant benefit by clearing backlog of IT projects and letting people have better access to data when they need it and as they need it. So you know, we see across industries, organizations that, that adopt this technique are able to move a lot faster, you know, maybe four times as, uh, the throughput of how quickly they can test out ideas and do analysis in the organization. So those are, those are some, some of the uh, examples. You know, obviously, in each industry, these different examples play out in a different way. But we think that, the, that hopefully that gives a little bit of a taste for some of what people are doing with big data and some of the, the opportunity. You know, we, we see this is definitely a journey right, that many organizations have started from a traditional uh, business intelligence and relational mindset. And that there's a series of steps to go from that starting point to being a data-driven organization. And you know, we, we see that as putting together a roadmap, a, a plan, a, a notion of, you know, we're really believers in the way you ought to approach this is with some business goal in mind. How am I going to impact the business? What is this new data going to let me do that's going to have a real radical benefit for my users, for my business? Not the, the, the mythology that so often is brought up of three data scientists in a cave <coughs> uh, work in isolation and magic comes out, right? It's, it, it's a lot more, we think it, there's a lot of intuition around business problems, business opportunities where data can have a big impact prioritizing those and then, then, then focusing on a pilot where you really focus on putting the right resources to achieve a measurable benefit and then use that as a foundation for further work. 
do more, test more, build up more of a portfolio of different projects to create more value and uh, start to invest more in, in data science and the platforms with the ultimate goal being uh, increasingly automated intelligence and an enterprise that is data driven. So you know, we think that uh, to be successful with big data requires a few things. It requires real engagement of the business and the technology groups. You need executive sponsorship with that vision of what you can achieve in the business that's going to be a real meaningful benefit so that there's a real uh, vision with that of leadership. You know, we think that um, there's enough complexity here that, it, that uh, boutiques like Think Big Analytics that have smart people who work on shore closely with our customers make a big difference in speeding up the time to value and the cycles of delivering results. Um, and we think it's a very much important to have a test and learn approach. Uh, the, the, the rules are still being written. The use cases, the details of how to apply this stuff and create value in your organization is going to be unique to you. And so you, the faster you can iterate, the faster you can get something into production that's actually driving a result from your investment, the sooner you learn, the sooner you can uh, change and, and invest in the right way and improve. So that does mean integrating it into business processes, right? We really think um, using big data should not be about just generating some reports like you might have done with the relational database. It's about integrating into process and having a deeper alignment between the technology and the business side of an organization. So with that, um, you know, it's worth pointing out um, how we like to help customers. We, we help with uh, both the planning, what we call imagine, thinking through what's possible, what are the roadmaps, what are the technologies to use, what is it going to take to achieve a goal, illuminate, we have training and education on the various technologies and, and techniques, and then implementation, real hands-on engineering and data science to create the value of building these, assembling these analytic applications from uh, open source and commercial product components. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, thank you for uh, listening to my talk today and uh, throw it open for uh, any questions you might have. So the question is, who are our competitors right now? I'd say the biggest, the biggest source of, of competition for us is organizations that, um, that, that try to, to go it alone and try to tackle these technologies and techniques on their own. Um, you know, they'd say, well, well, we'll just we'll learn it ourselves and we'll, we'll implement something on our own. And so often what we see is organizations get what I trapped on what I call the big data plateau, where they were able to put in Hadoop and start loading some data into it, but they didn't connect it with a business use case. They didn't have the, the, the ability to kind of connect it through to the end and flow. Back. So that, that's probably number one. And number two is uh, the, the market has picked up a lot, so you've got a lot of uh, traditional systems integrators of one form or another, off and offshore, saying, hey, we, we can implement this stuff for you. And they certainly can spell it, and they certainly will happily do work on a project, but we've seen uh, pretty, uh, it's not been a very successful model uh, from our, what we've seen in our customers to, to have offshore providers doing this work. Other questions? Secondly, you know, how is this different than what people were saying in the, the relational era? So certainly, to take examples, uh, you know, let me that uh, Kumar from NetApp is a customer, and they're a good example in the device analytics space. We, uh, we started working with them back in 2010. Um, they uh, saw me talking about, uh, I was giving a talk about work we've done with Quantcast, 
And uh, they said, well, this is interesting. You know, we'd like some help. And, and uh, we, we helped them with, before Gartner was covering the space, kind of understanding who are the players and what's going on in big data. We helped them with a roadmap to plan out how they might apply some of these big data technologies to big data technologies to, um, to working with uh, their uh, storage devices installed around the globe for some of the largest customers uh, to provide better service and support. You know, we, we built a proof of concept for them uh, that uh, convinced them that the, uh, not, not just the scalability and the cost advantage, but the, the ability to actually have ad hoc analysis to be able to look at data and, and troubleshoot and understand what was going on when there was an issue was, was significantly better with big data than with any traditional technology. Uh, yet another re-architecture of relational and try to keep up with the scaling constants. Um, and then they had us, uh, hired us as the architecture leads on a, uh, a large-scale mission critical implementation uh, to use the technology, which uh, they had Accenture as the, the kind of program managers and global systems integrator. Uh, we were smaller back then too. Um, so, you know, that's, the, and, and, and you know, we're continuing the journey with them. Well, I guess I can't talk yet about everything else. Um, so, you know, that's one example of a company that's made some significant investment in getting material advantages, you know, tremendous benefits in terms of scalability, in terms of response time, in terms of being able to have better access to information. You know, they, they've published some great case studies on that work, so that's a, that's a good example. Um, you know, we've also done work uh, with uh, large retailers, you know, doing things like dramatically speeding up their ability to process information around complex transactions and be able to analyze it and uh, when they were having difficulties keeping up with uh, daily calculation windows. We've had, uh, we've done work with uh, you know, innovative companies in the consumer space around uh, social video helping them uh, drive to better analysis and understanding of, of viral sharing and, and being able to better measure the effectiveness of ads that are running in their environment. You know, we've done work for uh, innovative companies in uh, a number of different sectors. You know, we've done, uh, so, you know, maybe thinking about uh, in the consumer, uh, companies that are uh, selling and doing more in the consumer space, we're advertising, you know, advertising is a great example. We've done work with a number of companies in helping them uh, build models to better predict interest for ads and to be able to pick the right ads that will uh, get consumers to respond and to tune and, and uh, adjust that, whether it be being hosted in the cloud, like a lot of startups or large organizations, like a lot of marketing services organizations that we helped blend their offline, personally identifiable information with online anonymous data to be able to better serve their customers, their large enterprise customers in the online world. So those are just a few of, of many examples of uh, meaningful companies that are leveraging big data and creating real business value that we've been able to help. Um, now, in terms of your other question, what about, um, what are some of the differences? Why is it different this time, right? And, and I, think, I think there's, there's a couple of things. One is uh, the, the relational database architecture that we've all been living with for the last 30 years was in fact designed around the kind of computers that were available 30 years ago, and the kind of networks and storage, right? That you, you just being able to touch the data once was hard. You know, being able to store it was almost inconceivable. It's hard to, re to remember how much more capacity we have in, in, in all these dimensions than in, in 1980, right? I mean, uh, you didn't, hard drives were extremely expensive, and a, a, few, a few megabyte hard drive was a big disk back when people started working with relational database. So the time it took to read an entire disk was way faster, right? Now it takes hours to do a scan of all the data on a multiple terabyte hard disk. So the systems have changed dramatically. And so there's a need to have cluster computing uh, to be able to store and process data efficiently. Um, the, the data volumes have kept up in, in a sort of a positive feedback loop of we can capture data we never would conceive of capturing before and use it in new ways. Um, so on the one side, there's this demand, right? And, and I think we know this is different because we've seen uh, a number of companies many of them in the online space, many of them uh, digital natives that have proven that they are able to process data and, and be data driven where they can come up with innovation and new ideas much more quickly with these technologies. That it is supporting an agile approach to working with data 
And fundamentally, I think that's the difference, is that relational worldview has been one of, we need to put everything into new boxes and pre-parse it and organize it so we can answer the questions we anticipated in advance. And big data is more agile. It's about putting data in a raw form and having it more complete and being able to go back and re-examine things. Why? Because we now have the resources to do those things that we never really could conceive of before. So I guess that's what I would argue is that it, it represents a trade-off of having more compute resources to work with information so that we have less human resources working with information. Yeah. So speaking of agile, then, and analysis, it seems like many companies use distributed systems but in a very centralized fashion. Uh, one data store that you have everything in as opposed to uh, smaller data stores for from Sure. So the question is, um, it seems uh, to, to the questioner that they, a lot of companies are, are centralizing these big data stores instead of having a more distributed model and wondering if there's challenges with that. And you know, we, we see a mix. I mean, we, we have customers that are very much interested in uh, saying, look, we, we don't necessarily want to backhaul uh, tens of terabytes of data to a common data center every day. Uh, we'd rather have tiering where we have some amount of decisions, some amount of analysis and storage being done in each data center where we operate. And then we, we bubble some amount of information into a more central place for deeper modeling and centralized analysis. Um, so there, there are cases where that, that model um, is being tested out, although it's, it's not as common as in um, the case where we see a lot of decentralization and distribution is around systems of engagement. When you, when you have a website or a mobile app where you're really trying to get low latency response to users, uh, it's very common to want to have uh, lots of data centers so you can, you, the speed of light uh, will work in your favor, that you can be closer to their machines and you want to have a database that sits near them that, that holds relevant information about them. So that tends to drive the architecture of technologies like Cassandra where you've got uh, a database that's built companies that are interested in and thinking about how can they split some of the deeper analytics across multiple data centers and not have to move as much data around. What's, uh, is there concerns about working with open source versus closed source technologies? And I think big data is an interesting uh, wave of innovation. It's, it's the first uh, kind of fundamental technology that's being led by open source. Uh, in the past, you've had uh, commercial technology lead a, a wave of innovation, and then it, it's been followed by open source once the, the form factor has stabilized and, and there's now an opportunity to implement a, a, a similar uh, technology in an open source project. With big data, though, um, the commercially uh, available, the first commercially available and widely adopted uh, big data technologies have been open source. So Hadoop, um, NoSQL databases, and, and in fact, you, know, you see Google is a, a pioneer in the space, kind of offering a commercial implementation uh, later than the, the widespread adoption of the open source options. Right, so I, what we see is that there's, there's still a, a testing ground. There's a number of companies that are trying open source and commercial models and cloud-based models as well. Um, to, it can be a kind of, of commercial model, it can be a kind of open source. Um, but um, I think that uh, over and over we see that there's a strong bias in favor of open source. And as I always like to say, you know, if you think it's hard to uh, make money in an open source business, try competing against one. Right? That it's, it, it, it really has become um, the kind of the foundation point of a lot of the industry is that it's an open source led movement and you've got companies that are applying you know, various hybrid models of some, some open source technology and some commercial approach for how they can monetize and, and add value on top of open source. How do we work with companies in the healthcare space and how does big data apply to healthcare? And we work with companies, a couple of different kinds of companies in healthcare and life sciences. Um, 
we've done work um, on gene sequencing for a, a, a company that was is uh, gathering, you know, has a fair amount of genetic data, rapidly growing amounts, and you know, it's a very computationally intensive uh, process, and, and definitely very benefit, much benefits from the capacity of something like a Hadoop, and in this case it was Hadoop, to, to do efficient models, to do sequencing and analysis. Um, I think that one especially is interesting because uh, what we see is that the, the dramatic drop in, drop in price of sequencing genomes is resulting in increased use in, in therapy as people are, are fighting cancer, they're getting sequenced. And you know, I think in the next few years, as the price continues to drop, that's going to become a more and more prevalent thing that you're going to see clinics where uh, they routinely have a big data problem. Anyone that's treating cancer, that they're going to be having lots and lots of gene sequencing and they need to be able to do comparisons and analysis. That's just one of many areas, though, in healthcare. You know, with lots of interesting work around how can you have better predictive outcomes to understand what's likely to work or not for somebody. Um, can, you, can you have a better model that's not just a What's the, what, what, what's the one size fits all, but individualized medicine, better predictive models of what's going to work for you, and how, how quickly can you say this therapy isn't working, we need to do something else. Right? So I think there's a lot of promise and opportunity there uh, to do good, um, as well as you know, being a technology that can enable upstream uh, drug discovery, and, and uh, that was actually another customer of ours, was applying big data to better predict uh, regulatory issues where there might be a, a, a problem in, in a given therapy so that uh, to try to use big data to better identify those problems and minimize waste in the, uh, the, the investment process for uh, large pharmaceuticals and, and medical device companies. Just a couple of examples. Good questions. Uh, how do you assess the quality of data and avoid garbage in and garbage out? And do you uh, use sampling techniques so uh, to expedite your analysis? Well, I definitely, uh, to take the second one first, uh, it's very much the case that you want to, to build up uh, analysis incrementally in a big data system. So you typically want to start any kind of work or analysis on you know, the laptop and then a small sample in a shared environment in a Hadoop cluster and kind of build up and encounter uh, and make sure your analysis is sound and you understand what's going on in smaller scale and then incrementally build up. You know, e even if you've got about a thousand node cluster and, and petabytes of data, uh, you don't want to just turn a huge comp computational news on that data and then discover, oh, that wasn't a very good idea. Uh, I didn't form that question quite right. Let me start over, right? You want to kind of work your way in and understood the problem and, and incrementally build up. And, and this is always a, uh, an education process, that and sort of some of the basics of how to tune and, and, and run things efficiently in a big data environment. Um, but then the first question, you know, how, how do you deal with data quality? I think it really is it's incremental. So the, the notion is instead of having um, the old uh, idea that you want to have everything be cleansed and perfect and you kind of put a lot of work up front uh, speculating on this is going to be a valuable data set, this is going to be a valuable thing to work with, uh, in, in the agile analytics mold that, that big data enables, you, you, you start off with data in raw form and you put some approximate structure and you start to understand. And, and as you've proven values, you say, wow, this is really promising. We're seeing a lot of signal here. That's when you start to invest in structure and governance and, and you know, all the same uh, uh, requirements apply, right? If you want to share amongst a group, you need to have documentation, you need to have change control. But the difference is you want to invest in those things only after you've shown them value and only after you've got some standards instead of doing it up front. But you know, fundamentally, uh, those those laws of physics apply, and you know, we do see a lot of organizations that, that have underinvested. It's, you know, there's been a, a lot of the early adopters of this technology have been a little bit more of a wild west atmosphere and have underinvested in governance, and it does cause problems downstream. So the pros and cons of going with graph versus... Yeah.
So, uh, you know, there's uh, different, uh, different technologies for analyzing graphs. I mean, there's some that are, you know, there's uh, technologies like uh, I know, Titan and, and uh, like Faunus uh, that are a couple of open source graph technologies that work on top of Hadoop, the Hadoop stack. Um, and then there's often specialized uh, graph databases like an objectivity. Uh, you know, so, so I would say that, um, that it's still pretty early on in terms of, of using uh, different graph techniques in the big data space. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of nascent projects, um, but um, I would say that there's still, uh, it still hasn't been as proven out and as, as widely adopted. Right? So I'd say that we, we think that there's uh, it's clearly value in being able to apply graph techniques on top of a Hadoop stack or on top of a Cassandra as standard technologies rather than using something that's more specialized. And instead, what's been used a lot more are, are tools like Neo4j that are, are more hardened and, and, and certainly more proven out, but typically uh, have some scale limits that are more difficult to, to work around. Right? So for medium-sized graphs, there's a lot of mature technology, and it's more experimental for truly large-scale graphs. Any other questions? So does our company provide training? Um, yes, we offer training on both uh, technical uh, elements of big data, you know, uh, uh, data science, uh, Hadoop, HBase, uh, as well as uh, upcoming uh, training we're working on for Storm uh, as we're streaming real-time big data technology. And we also have business seminars to help uh, business leaders understand what can be done uh, with big data. Thank you very much.